In the 1970s, jogging and running was slowly becoming a lot more mainstream and popular as more than just this Olympic event, people were doing it as a hobby, for fun, for working out, to get a little, shed a couple of those extra pounds, which is wild to me, first of all, that it took for the 1970s for like running to become popular. Trying this new fad called uh, jogging. I believe it's jogging or yogging. It might be a soft J. And by the late 70s, brands had hopped on this trend and realized there's an opportunity to make some shoes for not just athletes, but for the everyday guy. And one of these brands was New Balance that started designing, in their opinion, the perfect running shoe starting in 1978. And over the course of four years, they designed, tested, prototyped, and tested again until 1982 when the iconic New Balance 990 was released. And the thing that made this shoe different is it was a no expense spared performance running shoe and had four years of research and development aimed at a customer base that wanted a locally produced high quality running shoe and retailed for a steep $100. And according to Nacho Average Finds, this was the first shoe that ever retailed for hundred bucks, which is $311 today. And New Balance touted this new made the United States shoe as a response to a lot of the other larger manufacturers that had already at this time started moving production overseas to get cheaper production. The 990 implemented a polyurethane heel cradle known as the MCD or the motion control device, which was so successful that it maintains a presence in New Balance's current crop of performance running shoes today. But by 1986, after the success of the pricey 990, an upgraded version called the 995 was released, which featured a visible polyurethane shell underneath the heel called the end cap, which was a heel unit that cupped your heel and prevented it from slopping over the side of the shoe. And customers really responded well to the 995, making it another popular release by New Balance. But after their performance, performance-based predecessors, New Balance saw a change in the market as people realized athletic shoes were more than just comfy to run and they were pretty comfortable for everyday life. So they decided to develop what they called the ultimate hybrid shoe and spent the next few months and years designing it until 1988 when the next iteration of the 990 line was released, the 996. And unlike the very small transition between the 990 and the 995, the 996 was a complete overhaul attempting to balance the performance of a running sneaker with the comfort of a casual sneaker. While still maintaining that end cap unit and that MCD cup that helps balance your heel. And on top of that, New Balance added in a dual density midsole, a two-tone outsole and a contemporary looking upper and high tensile mesh and leather. And even though the 997 was released just two years later, the 996 has remained a fan favorite since it was introduced 35 years ago. And even today in 2023, as fashion trends change, the quintessential American shoe remains a staple of the sneaker rotation for people across the world. So does the current 996 live up to its history or is it just a shadow of its former self? Well, to find out, we're gonna run it through our test and really see how good this leather actually is. Is the MCD a functional piece of tech? And is the end cap all just a facade on the outside or is it actually all these different densities once we get it cut in half? Cold turkeys may be great on sandwiches, but there's a lot better ways to break your bad habits. We're talking about our sponsor, Fume, and they look at the problem in a different way. Not everything in a bad habit is wrong, so instead of a drastic, uncomfortable change, why not just remove the bad from that habit? Because Fume is an innovative, award-winning device that does just that. Instead of electronics, Fume uses flavored air, and instead of harmful chemicals, Fume uses delicious flavors like this one, raspberry lemon. You get the point, instead of bad, Fume is good. It's a habit you're free to enjoy and make replacing your bad habits super easy. And your Fume comes with an adjustable airflow dial and is designed with movable parts and magnets for fidgeting, listen to this. Which gives your fingers something to do, which is a really helpful way to de-stress and reduce anxiety while breaking that bad habit. And honestly, I was I didn't really know what to expect from this until we got it in. And it actually, once you throw these little cartridges in there, it is actually pretty effective because you can actually taste and feel that flavor. It has a nice heft to it. It's made out of some nice wood and some heavy metal, so it feels quality. And stopping is something we all put off because it's so hard, but switching to Fume is an easy, enjoyable, and fun way to break habits. And Fume has served over 150,000 customers and has thousands of success stories, and there's no reason that that can't be you. Head to tryfume.com slash Rosanville right now or scan the QR code and use my code Rosanville because they're having an amazing 20% off site-wide sale running from now until December 1st. And after that, you can still use my code for a 10% off. And you can upgrade your journey pack to the Solano to enjoy a premium walnut barrel and an onyx black coated mouthpiece that has a smoother finish. So what is the information on this shoe? Well, the brand is New Balance. The style is the Made in USA 996. They weigh 15 ounces. They retail for $199. They're made in the United States. And the way that New Balance positions their Made in the USA line is New Balance Made in US footwear contains a domestic value of 70% or more. Made makes up a limited portion of New Balance's US sales. So that's always the question of 
of like what that means, the domestic value, but we'll put a brief understanding of it here. That seems to be the consensus. So now first let's look at this leather. Is it any good? Well, New Balance, their site says the, it's leather mesh and a suede upper. And it also says it's a pigskin and mesh. And so looking at it from the outside, it doesn't really look like pigskin just because of how loose the, the fibers are on the inside, but it easily could be, but it's impossible to tell because it has such a heavy plastic coating on top. And you know, with sneakers, it's kind of how it goes. You know, there's, they're, they just are doing so many quantities. They don't like to use more natural materials that have a lot of flaws in them naturally, just because of how many returns they're gonna get, if there's a little scratch or bug bite on it. And so they just always err on the side of putting a fat slab of plastic over top, which makes it really tough to see what the leather quality is. More importantly, for people that like to keep their sneakers really pristine and clean and not creasing, it makes this leather a creasing machine. Even pushing it with your finger, you can see all those little hairline wrinkles happening because of that separation from the plastic coat from the, the leather underneath. But how good is the leather underneath of that plastic coating? Well, we put the macro lens on it and it seems like there's plenty of grain still in there, which is that structural tight grain pattern on top of leather that gives it its smooth uh, texture and surface. And so at least it's not that bottom of the barrel New Balance leather we've seen where it's just a cheap suede with a plastic coating hiding the cheaper leather. And the thickness is about 1.2 millimeters thick, so pretty on par for most sneaker leathers. And we did the puncture test on it and only took 30 pounds. So fourth from the bottom of all the puncture tests that we've done. So is it pig leather? I it's honestly hard to tell. It could be, but it, it looks a little bit more like a cow leather. Well, what about this MCD or the motion control de device? What is this supposed to do? Well, it's a, like I said, it's a little cup that helps stabilize your cup from rolling the, over on the side or having your heel slop over on top of the midsole. And fortunately, we got a flawed pair we bought from New Balance and it came up a little bit here. So we're able to get our, our little caliper in there and see how thick it is. And it's two millimeters thick, so plenty thick to give you a little rigidity. And we put the durometer tester on it and it's 100 shore A. So it's pretty hard, it's pretty stable. And we cut down the shoe lengthwise to see if it actually does cup your heel, if it's high enough, and it clearly is. It should give you at least some support. Is it enough to actually say it's gonna make it a higher performance sneaker? I think it's mostly just a callback to that era while still giving you just a little bit of extra support. And, and to be fair, I'm sure if I had contacted New Balance, they would ship me a new one because that's a pretty clear flaw. But what about the other tech on this shoe, the end cap? And what is this supposed to do? Well, it's the midsole cushioning that combines lightweight foam with a durable polyurethane rim to deliver all day comfort. So really similar to that cup around your heel, but underneath of your heel. So we put the durometer tester on the different foams and the cream foam came in at a 50 shore A, the green is a 70 shore A, and the white is a 48 shore A. So clearly different densities, but does that mean that it's actually a cup when you get, look at the cross section of this? Well, once again, we cut it lengthwise to see if it is actually wrapping around your heel. And as you can see, it clearly does. So that harder foam, it looks like it, it stabilizes the outside of the shoe to prevent rolling while still having a softer foam right underneath of your heel to give you that impact resistance and a little extra squish. And to test it, we did the ball drop test and it bounced up 10.8 inches. So the lower part of the middle for, of the sneaker pack and the bar drop test, it bounced up seven inches. So the higher part of the middle of the pack. So from looking at it being filleted and the little test that we ran, to me, it points to the fact that these, this still is usable tech. It may be old, but they are at least giving you what they're saying they're giving you. Unlike a lot of the other sneakers we see where it's an old school tech, where they just give you a little bit of that hexalite in the heel, or it, it just looks like it works, but it doesn't actually have any differences in the densities of foams or however the tech works in that particular shoe. So at least that's good to see. The leather, on the other hand, leaves me a little bit wanting for uh, a less plasticky leather, but like I mentioned, to get a bright pea yellow sneaker, you almost have to do it. So now let's cut it in half and see what's on the inside and if there's any extra layers that we don't know about.
All right, we got it cut in half. And if you're not subscribed, consider just taking the mouse, dragging it down and pushing that little subscribe button because it's a really free and easy way to support the channel and help us pay to cut apart two brand new pairs of boots and shoes every single week. So well, let's see what's inside. So now to the big question, is this a facade of the former performance version of this shoe that was popularized in the 80s, or is it an accurate recreation that still utilizes older technology? Well, pretty clearly from the inside, you can see that it is built in a way that they are trying to, that they, that they are using that old school tech to make this shoe perform the way that that old shoe did. And I think that's a really cool way to feel the history of sneakers and, and really understand where sneakers came from, from 40 years ago up until today and how the technology has advanced because I just like when you're able to wear the actual, a version of the actual shoe that was popularized 40 years ago, rather than just this, this the shoe that kind of looks like it. it's the facade with a few of the features without actually being able to feel what it actually felt like when they were released. But it is pretty pricey, you know, it's a $200 sneaker and it's a very simple design and construction. You know, there's multiple layers of foam, but it's really, it's really not like space age tech that you could say, oh, that's clearly worth 200 bucks. So why is it worth 200 bucks? Well, probably mostly because it's made in the United States. And it does seem like it's a multi-layered construction that would take a little bit of time to make. And there's a lot of people who are willing to pay that premium for US made goods. And I, you know, honestly, it is pretty cool that New Balance is still making shoes in the United States when so many other giant corporations and other giant sneaker companies have completely left that behind and have everything made overseas. So even though this is a very simple shoe for $200. It's hard not to like, but is it worth the price? If you just look at it as a shoe, do you get anything more from being made in the United States? Not really. And so to me, that premium really is coming from the fact that it's made in the United States. And I personally, I love the shoe. I think it's a really cool shoe. I just wish that the leather was a little bit better, but it's not the worst leather we've seen from New Balance. So overall, I like this shoe. And I, I think if you, if you have the money and you're fine paying a little bit extra for US made good, it is money well spent because it is an actual representation of the shoe that made this current version popular. So let me know what you guys think and thank you guys so much for your support. And we're gonna rank this on the Matusa board because it's technically Matusa. So we'll rank it here and thank you for everything you guys do. And let me know what you think and your experience in these and what other sneakers you want us to cut apart. And thank you so much for all your support. See ya.